After a storied career as a music executive, including a gig with Apple Records, Ken Mansfield says the high point came atop a roof in London. It was a cold January day in 1969. Ken was one of a few spectators at a private performance of the legendary Beatles, all told in his newest book, The Roof. The Roof. What roof? What are you <laughs> talking about? The top of the Apple Building in Savile Row in downtown London. And the Beatles, of course, were well known to my wife, Nedra, with the Ronettes, because they toured together. Exactly. That rooftop session was recorded for the Beatles' Let It Be film, but it wasn't just another performance. And actually, the Beatles had not played together. In two years. Two years? Yeah. And all of a sudden, the last time they were ever played last together? Time. A strange thing happened that day. Now, I'm sitting about four to six feet away from them, and they started playing, and it was either John looked over at Paul or Paul looked over at John, and it was like they just looked at each other and went, you know what, this is us. We've mm. been mates for a long time. We've done things nobody's ever done. We've been close forever. And right at this moment, this is who we are, a good rock and roll band. Mm. I wrote my favorite line in the book. I said they came up on the roof without a sound check, but they went back down the stairs with a soul check. How well did you get along with the lads? You were with them a lot. I got along with them real well. The interesting thing is when they, I worked with them in 65, and that was when they were just super on top, you know. It was only the second time they came to America. And uh, I was this young guy with a suntan and uh, a Cadillac convertible living in the Hollywood Hills in a house in a pool. And now they're working with a young guy their age. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they start asking me a bunch of questions, like where's Mulholland Drive? And uh, Ringo wanted to know if I could introduce him to Buck Owens because Buck was on Capitol. <laughs> and uh, that started a relationship, both as a business relationship and a personal relationship that developed out of that. Looking back now, what do you want to convey? Well, I want to convey that uh, they were really nice guys. Yeah. I know they weren't perfect, and I know they had some times, <laughs> and those times got more publicity than anything, but they were real people. I wanted people to get the feeling what it was like to be around them, because I also like, spent a lot of personal time with them, and uh, there was just this sense of they were, I use the word common because they grew up common, you know, mm -hmm. and they never left that. How did it affect you years later when John was shot yeah. and George died? Yeah, mainly when John died because the dream was over. The Beatles were never going to re reunite. And my sense of loss was not, wow, I lost a friend, I lost an associate, I lost something like that. My feelings was I went back into the universal sadness that we all share, that everybody shared around the world. No more songs, you know, no more craziness, <laughs> no more Beatles reuniting. And so uh, it was a very, very emotional day. And, and George, and of course. George, yeah. Well, George, we had time to think about, and we knew he was going. But it was John who, that famous quote that got him a lot yeah. of trouble, that they were more popular than Jesus yeah. now. Uh, how did that affect uh, the thinking of the of the band and their lives at that point? Well, John, and he, he, he has talked about this several times, and he told me, he said, that I was just trying to make a point, there's something wrong with the youth today, that they're worshiping a band mm -hmm. instead of worshiping like Jesus. Where did Jesus intersect your life? Uh, he intersected my life uh, when I was about as down as far as you could go. And uh, then I met uh, a young, beautiful lady who became my wife. And I had a guru, and I was broke, and I was a stoner, and, and I was bad news then. And uh, one day she called and she said, we need to talk. And she said, I see where our relationship is going, and I have to make a choice between you and Jesus, and I choose Jesus. Whoa. I went home, and I thought, I want something to be so dear to me that I'm willing to give up something that's very important to me, which was our relationship. I thought, uh, I want that. I want that more than anything. I became the spiritual head of our relationship, and I mean, I devoured the Bible. I didn't read anything but the Bible for three years. I mean, I was just all in. This brings us, you know, again to the book. Why did you write it? What do you want to say to people? I realized what I had here was a chance for ministry. I'm a seed planter, and it was just a way to plant seeds. I wasn't trying to make a sale. I was just trying to 
plant some seeds. I thought, I've got the beetle pens, and I'm, I'm staying true to them. You know, I'm giving them all the things they want to know. So at the end, I want to talk to them about God now.